incident involving a Corpus Christi police officer uh, that was shot this afternoon. We want to send thoughts and prayers for Manuel Dominguez and his family. Uh, we were relieved to hear that he is in stable condition and we do wish him a speedy recovery. The suspect is still outstanding and it is an ongoing investigation. Um, and I would ask that you please reach out to CCPD if you have any information uh, that will put this case to rest. So as we know, COVID-19 cases have been rising throughout the city. As of today, only 50% of those eligible in Nueces County are fully vaccinated. And over 71% of those ages 65 years and older are vaccinated. We know that the Delta variant is much more transmissible and more virulent. So as of now, the most dominant strain in Texas is the Delta variant. We are at a new level of urgency, and according to the Centers for Disease Control, Nueces County is on the high level of community transmission. I want our residents to know that we had a mother who was not vaccinated. She delivered her baby a few weeks ago and just passed away last weekend from COVID-19 complications. New information from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, uh, which are the two leading organizations representing specialists in OB care, recommend all pregnant individuals be vaccinated against COVID-19. I understand that there were uh, conflicting research uh, or there was conflicting research done early on, um, but as we've learned uh, more about this virus, the information I just relayed is the most up to date. And as of yesterday, the CDC states that pregnant women are an in at an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19 when compared to those who are not pregnant. These organizations show evidence confirming that it is safe for pregnant individuals to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And people who want to get vaccinated can do so as early as this Friday. The city county health district will have a mass vaccination drive through clinic this Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Old Christus Spahn Hospital Memorial site located at 2606 Hospital Boulevard. We're trying to make receiving your vaccine as convenient as possible and as in many different ways as possible. That said, you can still acquire that vaccine for free at the La Palmera Mall, which is located at the Old Charming Charlie location across from Grimaldi's uh, Pizza. That vaccine clinic is open every day Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Sundays from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And if you need a ride to get your vaccine, the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority will provide just that, free rides to and from the city's vaccination clinic at La Palmera Mall. And lastly, with school beginning with in-person attendance, we urge you to vaccinate your children who are 12 years of age and older. Let's all do our part to keep our community safe and move forward together uh, in, the safe, in the safest manner that we can. And now we'll pause for a brief Spanish translation. Primero quiero enviar todas las bendiciones al hospital, al, perdón, al oficial de policía quien resultó herido esta tarde. Nuestros pensamientos y mejores deseos para el oficial Manuel Domínguez y su pronta recuperación. El sospechoso del asalto se encuentra un prófugo, así que le pido si usted cuenta con información sobre su paradero, se comunique con la policía local. Los casos de COVID-19 continúan aumentando en la ciudad. Las últimas cifras indican que solo el 50% del condado de Nueces está completamente vacunado y más del 71% de ellos tienen 65 años o más. La variante Delta es mucho más transmisible y más virulenta. Hoy esa variante es la dominante en el estado. Estamos en un nuevo nivel de urgencia y según los Centros para el Control de Enfermedades, el condado de Nueces se encuentra en nivel alto de transmisión comunitaria. Hace solo días, una residente del condado dio a luz a su bebé. Ella no estaba vacunada y desafortunadamente falleció el fin de semana pasado por complicaciones. 
Información más reciente proveniente del Colegio Estadounidense de Obstetras, Ginecólogos y la Sociedad de Medicina Materno-Fetal, las dos organizaciones líderes que representan a los especialistas en atención obstétrica, recomiendan que todas las mujeres embarazadas se vacunen contra el COVID-19. Los Centros para el Control de Enfermedades, o CDC, indicaron que las mujeres embarazadas tienen un mayor riesgo de sufrir una enfermedad grave por COVID-19 en comparación con las personas que no están embarazadas. Los CDC indican que la vacuna es segura para las mujeres embarazadas. Las personas que quieren vacunarse pueden hacerlo también este viernes durante una megaclínica que se va a llevar a cabo de 7.30 de la mañana a 7.30 de la noche en el antiguo sitio del Hospital Memorial, ubicado en el 2606 del Hospital Boulevard. Estamos trabajando para que la vacuna esté disponible de la manera más conveniente. Recuerde, también puede vacunarse en el Centro Comercial La Palmera, ubicado en el antiguo local de la tienda Charming Charlie's. La vacuna, las vacunas en esta clínica están abiertas todos los días de lunes a sábado de 10 de la mañana a las 9 de la noche y los domingos de 11 a 6. Good afternoon, everybody. Barbara Canales, Nueces County Judge. Well, today I want to talk about a few things that are incredibly important to me as the emergency management official for Nueces County. A big part of this job in the pandemic is resource management. That means those are resources like hospital capacity, testing supplies, vaccines, personal protective equipment, the list goes on and on. One of the things which is hard to create from thin air is hospital bed capacity, especially when you lose it. So we have worked to manage capacity here in Nueces County. We've worked so hard to grow capacity and we've worked hard to reduce demand. And we've done things to manage this capacity. We've established a COVID clinic, which is still operational to help patients manage their care. And sometimes that means encouraging people to go to the hospital based on their symptoms, even if they insist they don't feel that bad. It just depends on the unique individual and their circumstances. Because getting them into the hospital at the right time can reduce severity and duration of their illness. And you won't know that unless perhaps you visited with a healthcare professional. Waiting can turn what would have been a walk-in admission into a standard bed into an emergency room admission, going into the intensive care unit. And unfortunately, it could mean a ventilator. Now we have grown capacity. We have helped hospitals build additional capacity to have as a reserve for the wave of COVID patients. We've explored everything, hospital tents, and we actually have them on standby. Did you know we have three hospital tents that are capable of not only uh, functioning, uh, for any need we might have, but they're air conditioned. We made those arrangements last year with the International Medical Corps. Through the Texas Department of Emergency Management, affectionately known as TEDM, we have requested and received equipment and personnel. And last year, Governor Abbott, through executive order, did restrict elective surgical procedures to ensure we had bed space for those battling COVID. This feels like all these good things we did was an effort to grow capacity. After all, we grew capacity to handle COVID cases by telling the hospitals that they couldn't perform certain procedures. That's what that was all about last year. But it's a really important temporary management tool. It's not a growth tool. It's an extraordinary measure that can only work in the short term. Elective procedures are important. They improve quality of life, and as problems get worse over time, it's an important tool to have in your community. But by far, the biggest thing we've done is reduce demand. And we did it how? By playing defense. Good health, hygiene practices, those three W's we're always talking about. All of that was 2020. And in January, how many times have we said it? We finally got to have an offensive strategy 
we began providing free vaccines first obviously as you recall to the most vulnerable medical personnel but it wasn't long it wasn't long at all before everybody who wanted one could get one and it felt so good to watch numbers decline it felt so good to see infections daily uh, infections and daily hospitalization rates daily icu and yes daily deaths decline we were winning we were succeeding and then and then came the delta variant and it's triggered another surge of infections and last week at this press conference i showed a graph but i'm going to walk you through i don't have a graph today but i want you to listen i want to walk you through what is a surge people ask all the time what does the surge mean? What does it look like? We track hospital bed capacity. And summer started off pretty great. We were in good shape for all of June. Our hospitalization rate was below 3%. But in late June, several days in late June, we were at 2%. And over the next three weeks, it went up 1% per week. Think about that. And on July 7th, that was kind of when you saw something happening, it went to 3%. By July 14th, 4%. July 21st, 5%. And then the surge does what any good wave does. It built momentum. Two days later, not a week later, two days later, we were at 6%. Three days after that, 7%. And literally, for each day in a row, we went up another percent. And guess what? Yesterday, we're practically at, it's a little under 13 percent, 12.68. But for all practical purposes, 13 percent. Hospitalizations are almost at that 15 percent threshold needed under the 2020 order for Governor Abbott, um, under Governor Abbott's order in 2020, where we had some local control to issue certain capacity limits and mask mandates. We don't have that ability anymore. The governor's current orders issued last Thursday do not give us those authorities. But that 15% threshold, guess what? It was set for a reason. It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't a random number. Hospitals don't have a large amount of excess capacity. And the idea is, is that if you hit 15% with COVID patients, the hospital system is highly stressed. And when it's highly stressed, we're all stressed because we are the healthcare center for our entire region. And we are almost at that 15% threshold. What is it 15% of? Bed space. Make no mistake, bed space is critically important. Standard beds, intensive care unit beds, those items are actually tracked and reported. That's how you know they're important. But tracking bed space makes an assumption. It's a really interesting concept that when you track bed space, that our hospitals have this trained and skilled medical professionals needed to take care of people in those beds. Now here's where we've got a problem. We have a nursing shortage, and by the way, it's not just here, and it's not even just in Texas. It's everywhere. And our capacity to handle these infections is limited by a shortage of nurses. Having beds available with no nursing staff is only slightly better than having any beds at all. And this weekend, I got word that the hospitals were stressed all the way up to San Antonio. They were on divert. ER diversion happens when an emergency room is dealing with numerous patients and requests emergency medical services, that's EMS, crews to divert to other hospitals for a few hours to give them time to clear their current patient load. However, if too many hospitals in the same area request diversions at the same exact time, we can be in a state of diversion override. Now, what does that mean? It means everybody's on divert then everybody's going to have to be open because the ambulance have to have somewhere to go. Corpus Christi and Nueces County is where our region, as I said, looks to medical care. We are the leaders in a huge radius for regional health care. 
but even we look to people. We look to San Antonio for specialized care and additional capacity. But San Antonio has been on diversion for eight days out of the last 10. This is what makes a statewide pandemic different from a local emergency like a hurricane or a fire or an explosion or any other kind of accident. In those types of emergencies, we can turn to our unaffected neighbors for help. And they can turn to us. And we do that all the time. But in a pandemic, when we're all surging at the same time, we are all facing the same crisis. And when it looked like we were defeating this pandemic, many of the emergency staffing actions were actually canceled by the state, whether it was medical teams from Texas Army National Guard, contract nurses provided by DISHES, the division uh, through TEDM, and the, of course we call it DISHES, the State of Health Services. They were not needed. So they, went, they were sent home. Then, as I said, everything changed. Delta arrived, and now we are all finding ourselves short-staffed. And I have reached out for help. And I'm glad that I reached out for help. But this help may take time, and it may not always be available when exactly we need it. As I said, there is a shortage all across this nation. Our shortage did not happen overnight. We entered this pandemic with a shortage of medical resources to begin with, along with a population that was older, poorer, and less healthy than our state average. Many nurses have left this workforce during the pandemic. This complicates things. Some was, you know, just made that decision due to workload or others due to providers which went out of business because of COVID. So on Sunday, when area hospitals were on divert, I asked that in this time of crisis, all nurses who were able and not currently working to step up and contact us so that we could facilitate their goodness in helping this community with those hospitals in need. I know that when our community is facing an enormous challenge, our nurses have always risen to the challenge. I knew it in my heart and we were right. Do you know that HCA needed 40 nurses and do you know how many we had respond to the call as of just five minutes ago? 40. And do you know why? Because we need to make sure that we protect the integrity of our healthcare system. It's the most important thing any emergency manager can do. Our hospitals are holding career fairs now, incentive packages now, open houses. And by the way, some of the hiring bonuses you may have heard are up to $20,000. If you are a nurse and you want to see how quickly you can help, contact the Nueces County Helpline at, I better put my glasses on, 859-396-8204. One more time for the media, 859-396-8204. We can provide information for you and it can be in a variety of, of ways. You can be a pure volunteer if that's what you desire, but we're also facilitating um, those people who want to be a public health employee, or we can also facilitate referring you to the right uh, location inside our area hospitals, which are actively recruiting. By addressing this shortage, we can make sure that every hospital bed we have, we can use a bed in a hospital fully staffed with a trained medical staff. That's the win. In other matters of capacity, we are working to increase our capacity to deliver vaccines. Now, today there was a call at 2.30 p.m. and we have requested a DISHES strike team for vaccination. Director Rodriguez will have details on this when they are final. But our goal here is to play offense. We know that vaccines work. And although we've got a great system set up coming up tomorrow, I'm sorry, Friday at Memorial and La Palmera every day of the week, there's always more that you can do when you're in an emergency. And so again, vaccinations are the best method to pro provide protection against the Delta variant of this virus. It is reducing the severity of symptoms and the duration of the illness. 
we are seeing that 95% of our hospitalizations are with people who are unvaccinated, 95%. So having this Dishes Strike team come to Nueces County will help us bring vaccines to area where we have seen, for whatever reason, a disparity in the number of people vaccinated. So you're gonna see us in much more very localized neighborhood types of vaccines. This is very important. When the state of Texas agrees with the county, you know you're in trouble. And that's why they have said, we're going to react immediately. They called to say, how can we help? And we have also answered that call by providing the accurate information. We are grateful for the state of Texas to come to our aid in this regard. We're also requesting a BCFS team to operate a RIC that's a rapid infusion center. And I'd like to see this become um, a, a regional rapid infusion center and also an additional BCFS team to execute mobile infusions for our senior and our homebound population in trauma service area U. While our hospitals are short staffed, getting the BCFS team deployed, who's been helping the state for these past 18 months to our RIC, that rapid infusion center. And by the way, what are we infusing? Regeneron, the monoclonal antibody therapeutic that has been shown to really make a big difference when administered with mild or moderate symptoms. And I think this is a truly a force multiplier for our region. The RIC can treat patients on an outpatient basis and prevent hospitalizations. These mobile teams will reach those who can benefit from the treatment but can't travel. The Rapid Infusion Center is gonna help high-risk COVID-19 patients, again, who have the moderate to mild. If you're severe, you're gonna be in the hospital. But if you're a mild to moderate, we can assist you inside these infusion centers. By the way, they're already set up in other places around Texas, and it's good to know in a short amount of time, we'll have ours here for our community as well. And of course, what's the goal? Preventing admissions. The treatment involves, as I said, an IV infusion and uh, of these antibody medications. You should know that they have been authorized under the FDA under an emergency use authorization. And as I said, the early data and reports show excellent responses to this therapy. Now the local hospital system is truly short on staffing and operating over capacity. I spoke with Eric Evans last night. They were at 130%. And again, we are doing everything we can to address this shortage of, of, of staffing in a multitude of ways. The all call was only one element. There are other ways to address it, and we've been uh, leading and facilitating uh, that effort. The county, by the way, does not hire nurses. Only the hospital hires nurses. The hospital district does not hire nurses. We have a contract to provide indigent health care and indigent behavioral health care with Krista Spahn. But it is our hospitals that hire nurses, not us. And so, um, again, a fully operational, going back to that RIC, that infusion center, combined with a mobile infusion team, combined with the cities already doing, getting those homebound uh, vaccines operational again. All of these will allow, all these efforts are gonna allow our hospitals to care for those who need it the most. Hospital system will refer the appropriate patients to this RIC, okay? And so will your doctors and your clinics and they support a common goal to help mitigate the number of hospitalizations. We're very stretched. These are the efforts that your county and city county public health department are putting forward to make a difference. Now, we've designated the Richard Borchard Regional Fairgrounds located in Robstown, Texas as the location for the RIC, and this site has been secured, it's well vetted, and it's the location where we held so many successful mass vaccinations. The facilities and parking are ideal for safe patient flow from reception to treatment to post-treatment monitoring. Most importantly, the fairgrounds is located at I-69 and US-77 near Texas 44 and close to I-37. This provides maximum accessibility to the residents across TSUA. This is very important 
We are doing this in coordination with our RAC, who basically handles, CBRAC handles our TSUA. That's that trauma service um, area, TSA, rather U, trauma service area, and our designation is the letter U. In closing, like vaccines, these infusions are a way to fight back. And I believe that staffing a rapid infusion center and having a mobile infusion team is the best and highest possible use for a BCFS team. And it will pay dividends. It will pay dividends by improving patient outcomes and preventing inpatient hospitalizations at our already stressed facilities. We are in this pandemic still. We are in a surge. We are vulnerable. We are in high transmiss transmissibility, but we are still all in this together. Please do your part. Get vaccinated. Encourage others to do so. I've told you about the numbers. I've seen these numbers go up before. I've been thinking a lot about last summer. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be experienced to understand what happens to you if you react too late. I understand that people die when you react too late. We have to make every effort. We have to turn over every stone. We have to have vaccine clinics everywhere. We have to have rapid infusion centers. We've gotta be mobile. We've gotta be fixed. We've gotta work day and night. We've got to do everything in our possible, in our potential, uh, in the realm of possibility to make these numbers go back down. I remember in July of 2020 when hospitalization was at 20%. Last summer, my job at managing capacity had me requesting temporary morgue trucks because we had so many people dying. We didn't have any tools back then. We couldn't fight back. Not like we can today. Vaccines antibody treatments, COVID clinics. I want us to defeat this Delta variant and I need your help. I'm asking for your help. If you're a healthcare professional, call us. If you have a way that you can convince someone to get informed and get that vaccine, now is the time. I thank you for your time. Stand ready for answering your questions. And most of all, the highest, most deepest admi admiration for whoever you are. You 40, you 40 that called our number and answered the call to your community, you are beyond heroes. You are saints. Thank you. Hoy quiero hablarle como administradora del Centro de Manejo de Emergencias del Condado. Entre los suministros que se ocupan durante una pandemia se encuentran camas de hospital, por lo que hemos tomado pasos para aumentar la capacidad en los hospitales. Tenemos una clínica asignada solo para pacientes de COVID para ayudarlo en su cuidado antes de necesitar ir al hospital, pero al ir al hospital puede reducir sus síntomas y una rápida recuperación. Hemos explorado todas las posibilidades para aumentar la capacidad en los hospitales. Hemos pedido y recibido equipo para aumentar esa capacidad. Desde enero hemos ofrecido las vacunas contra el COVID, primero a los más vulnerables, después al resto de la población adulta, y hemos visto cómo las cifras de los enfermos y fallecimientos disminuyeron. Pero después sucedió la variante Delta. El verano comenzó bien, pero desde el mes de julio el porcentaje de casos ha ido en aumento. Ahora hemos aumentado hasta el 14% desde principios del mes de julio. Otro problema que enfrentamos es la falta de personal médico. Contar con camas de hospital sin enfermeros no ayuda. Los, hospit los hospitales de nuestra área están ya llenos. Los hospitales en San Antonio también están a capacidad. Esto es lo que hace una diferencia de durante una emergencia. Hemos pedido asistencia con enfermeras, pero también pudiera tomar tiempo en ver ayuda. Yo he pedido a los enfermeros que puedan ayudar, que se comuniquen con los hospitales locales. En los últimos días hemos recibido 40 enfermeros que han ofrecido su ayuda. Los hospitales están ofreciendo bonos de hasta 20 mil dólares. Así que si usted puede ayudar, se le pide comunicarse al 859-396-8204. También hemos pedido ayuda del Estado para poder llevar a cabo clínicas pequeñas de vacunación. y Cuando tengamos esos detalles, se los vamos a dar a conocer. También estamos pidiendo operar un centro para infusión rápida para proveer con infusiones a la población de la tercera edad y para quienes se encuentran en sus hogares y se les dificulta salir. 
Estos tratamientos pueden evitar las hospitalizaciones. Hemos designado el centro de exposición Richard Borchard para que ahí se lleve a cabo la clínica de tratamiento y evitar así, y evitar así más hospitalizaciones. Thank you, Gabby. Good afternoon, um, Annette Rodriguez, Health Director, and I am going to start with the COVID-19 statistics. First slide, please. So this is our daily count of COVID-19 cases over the last two weeks. If you look at the far right side, you're going to see numbers that start with 96, 148, 152. What's interesting is that these numbers were all below 20 just a few weeks ago. All of those numbers were 21, 23, 25, 26, and now look at the, the numbers. Last week, we've had 1,132 COVID cases here in Nueces County, and this past week, we've had close to 1,800 cases. Next slide. The majority of the cases have recovered. We have 44,347 people that have recovered. Again, we're looking back from last year, March of 2020 to the present. We've had 871 people die here in Noises County from COVID-19, and we have th over 3,000 active cases. That means that there's individuals in Noises County currently with COVID-19. Over 3,000 of those individuals are still active, infectious, and could still spread what we now know is the Delta variant. That's a total, if you add up all of these numbers, a total of 48,000. 386 cases of COVID-19 in Nueces County. The hospitalizations continue to rise as well. Last week, we had 636 people that were hospitalized for COVID-19. This week, we've had over 1,145 individuals hospitalized due to COVID-19. So we see almost a 100% increase from last week to this week. If you look at the number of patients in the ICU, you see the trend that's rising as well. And so last week we had 212 in the ICU due to COVID-19. And this past week we've had 296 individuals having to be in ICU requiring much needed attention from staff at the hospitals for COVID-19. The deaths, as we already talked about, are 871. The deaths will always go up because it is a cumulative number. And then finally, um, the fatalities, if you look at last week compared to this week, it's five last week and it's doubled and it's 10 this week. So fatalities will continue to go up as we know as, lo as long as cases continue to go up and hospital hospitalizations as well. So the health district uh, continues to vaccinate with a sense of urgency, and that's really important information. Since the arrival of the Delta variant, our cases have dramatically increased. Schools are being affected, nursing homes are seeing positive staff and residents again, they had not been. Some restaurants are having to close their doors because of COVID-19 positive staff that are causing staffing shortages. A few daycares have closed recently for COVID-19 positive uh, children in the daycare, and so they've had to go into quarantine for 10 days, so they've closed to disinfect. And there's been many, many other instances, too many that I can't even mention to you right now, that show how quickly this Delta variant is negatively affecting our way of life. The most important thing I'm going to say is COVID-19 is currently a vaccine preventable disease and vaccines are currently available and are the most effective way we know to suppress the transmission of this virus. It's not the only way though. We have discussed in the past the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the NPIs, as well as the pharmaceutical interventions. The NPIs are those public health strategies to protect us. What are they? social distancing, washing our hands, wearing a mask, not touching our eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. These pro proactive practices have been proven to work and we should continue to, to use them for this added protection needed currently. The pharmaceutical interventions, these are the therapeutics that the judge was talking about to help 
once a person is diagnosed with COVID-19. CDC has also recently put out guidance for therapeutics that can be used on probably rare occasions, but still they're available when there is a COVID-19 exposure of an immunocompromised individual that could potentially be deemed to have much poorer outcome if they contract the virus. The Delta variant is here in our community and it's spreading at supersonic speed. Texas has nearly 80% of all their cases are due to the Delta variant. And our numbers here locally are very similar to the state and the national numbers. It is highly contagious and looking for anyone that's unvaccinated in our community to infect. If you choose not to get vaccinated, then you should social distance yourself. Always wear a mask when out in public and stay home if you are sick. Also, protect your children. The number of children getting COVID-19 in the last few weeks is extremely high. We had not seen numbers like this ever. The more children infected, the more hospitalizations, and then we could begin losing more children to this deadly virus. This, various, this variant is causing havoc on our healthcare system with so many more daily cases and patients needing medical attention in a very short time period. I compare it to the rains. I think we're all very familiar with the rain. If it rains tons of inches, but it rains over a week time span, we can handle that. But when it rains a lot of inches in a very short period, under an hour, that's very hard to control. We see water coming into our homes. There's a lot of bad things that happen. That's what's happening in the hospitals. So many people are getting sick all at once. The public health department recently scaled down when we saw our numbers were improving just like everybody else. But we continue to look at the daily COVID numbers. While reviewing our daily COVID cases, we noticed increase in cases and brought it to both city council and commissioner's court. In fact, we actually told them that the Delta variant was here even before it had been identified on paper. So I want you to look at this slide that I have, because this is the slide that we were looking at at the health department that we were you know, starting to see these uh, numbers increase. And so if you look at the right side, it has July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and then down the middle, it has July 11th through the 20th. And then here on the left, it has uh, July 21st through the 30th. And I know there's 31 days, but I wanted to keep it 10 and 10 and 10 so we could compare across the board. So around July the 8th, we started seeing an uptick in hospitalizations. And we saw 42 cases, and then it went up to 44, and then it kept going up. But the other thing that's really important is that if you look at those first 10 days in July, and you add up all those COVID cases, and I told you the numbers were about 17, there was a 40 there, 8, 13, 40, 27, it, it comes out to 264 COVID cases in the first 10 days in July. What is really interesting is if you look at the last 10 days of July, July 21st through the 30th, and we're gonna leave out the 31st for now, the number of positive COVID cases is 2,016 cases. The same month, July, last month, a few days ago, the first 10 days, 264, the last 10 days, almost a 10 times fold increase in just that very short time period. Now look at the hospitalizations. The first 10 days, 309 hospitalizations. Look at the last 10 days in July, 1,080. And that's what happened that caused all of this problems and we knew that the Delta variant was here. That's how quickly the variant spreads. Even in a population that has 41% of the community fully vaccinated, this variant, it finds those unvaccinated individuals or the vaccinated that are immunocompromised and it invades their bodies to cause illness and many times causes them to have to be hospitalized. I've been watching the media and healthcare experts are literally begging people to get vaccinated. I'm not going to beg anyone. We are showing you here today the rapidly increased numbers of unvaccinated people being hospitalized and even dying from the Delta variant. Of these numbers, 1,080, about 97% of those are unvaccinated.
The choice of being vaccinated or not to get vaccinated is completely up to you. You're adults. We can present the science and what public health experts are recommending, but the decision is up ultimately up to you, and I have to respect that decision. Schools are opening up back uh, soon. Some of them have already opened. Some are opening today in Port Aransas. The Delta is getting into these schools and COVID-19 cases in children are rising. But let, re let me remind you that vaccines for these younger children is right around the corner. In late September or early October, the vaccines for those ages five to 11 should be approved. Keep your children from getting this virus. We still do not know what the long-term effects of this virus will be. As parents, our job is to parent our children by protecting and loving them. If you don't want them to get this potentially deadly virus and you want them to get vaccinated, I would ask that you consider getting vaccinated yourself. Children model what they see their parents do. We used to call it monkey see, monkey do. If, you see, if they see you stepping up to get vaccinated, they too will step up and do the same. It's one thing to make a decision that affects you and you alone, but it's a whole different story if the decision you make affects the lives of your children or others in our community. I'm not your children's parents, you are. But I want you to know, I would get vaccinated a thousand times over if I knew I could save your children by doing so. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So my one ask from all of you, all of the parents in Nueces County and the surrounding areas, is that you do what you think is best for your children. Our children's hospitalization numbers are increasing, but I have to stop worrying about those numbers and believe that each of you, as parents, will do everything in your power to protect your child from being hospitalized due to COVID-19. May God bless you and keep your unvaccinated children safe from what is now being coined the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Our mass vaccination clinic is scheduled for this Friday at the Old Memorial Hospital parking lot. You can register in advance at www.cctexas.com. We will start at 7.30 in the morning and end at 7.30 p.m. unless we run out of the 10,000 vaccines that we have for this clinic. We have all three vaccines, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the J&J, &J, and uh, these are for anyone 12 years of age and older. Thank you, stay safe, and as always, stay informed. El día de hoy se reportan 336 casos. En total son 3,168 los casos activos. 871 personas han fallecido en el condado de Nueces. 213 personas se encuentran en el hospital. 50 de esos se encuentran en la unidad de cuidados intensivos. El día de hoy, afortunadamente, no se reporta ningún fallecimiento. El Distrito de Salud continúa vacunando con sentido de urgencia. Con la variante Delta, los casos han aumentado considerablemente. Escuelas, hogares y negocios se están viendo afectados por el creciente número de casos. El COVID es prevenible con la vacuna, la cual se puede obtener fácilmente. Otras intervenciones no farmacéuticas también ayudan a la prevención de la propagación y obtención del virus, como el distanciamiento social, el uso de cubrebocas, la buena higiene, entre otros. La variante Delta se encuentra en nuestra comunidad y se propaga muy rápidamente. Es altamente contagiosa, especialmente con quienes no se han vacunado. Si usted elige no vacunarse, entonces se le sugiere tomar otras medidas de prevención como las anteriores. Se le pide también proteger a sus hijos, ya que las hospitalizaciones entre los pequeños también han aumentado. Las cifras se han disparado considerablemente. Del 1 de julio al 10 de julio fueron 264 los casos positivos y 309 hospitalizaciones, mientras que del 21 al 30 de julio los casos positivos fueron 2016 y 1,080 las hospitalizaciones. Esa variante ha afectado a personas vacunadas y no vacunadas. Usted como adulto debe de tomar su decisión para vacunarse o no tomar la vacuna y nosotros respetamos esa decisión. Mientras el regreso a la escuela está a escasos días, también el uso de vacunas para menores pudiera aprobarse tan pronto como el mes de octubre. Esto sería para niños entre 11, perdón, entre 5 a 11 años. Nosotros le pedimos que haga lo mejor para sus hijos y los proteja del virus, ya que aún está por saberse las secuelas que ésta tendrá a largo plazo. 
Le recordamos que este viernes habrá una clínica masiva de vacunación en el antiguo hospital memorial de 7.30 de la mañana a 7.30 de la noche. Tendremos las tres vacunas disponibles para personas mayores de 12 años. Para más información puede acudir al portal www.cctejas.com. Le recordamos que las vacunas son gratuitas. Thank you. Are there any questions? How have you seen folks who have gotten one shot, but not their second one that's required? And um, what is your message to those folks as well? Yeah, so I was looking at that uh, a little while ago, and it looked like there was around 20,000 individuals that have gotten one shot of uh, the mRNA vaccine, which is a two-dose requirement, and have not gotten their second one. I would uh, urge them to come in and get that second shot, because with the one shot, you only have 33% protection against this Delta variant, and with the two, you have 88% protection against even getting COVID-19 at all. You actually, if you do get COVID-19, you have 96% protection against being hospitalized. So it's really important. I have one more question. If numbers continue to increase, are there any concerns or plans to make sure we don't run out of supplies, medical supplies like PPE, uh, the therapeutic drugs for our hospitals? Yes, that's a great question. So absolutely, uh, we continue to ask, uh, I think the judge talked a little bit about it, we continue to ask the state. Uh, some of these orders that we're requesting are not going to be filled because we know, I mean, this is still across, you know, globally, not just here you know, locally. Uh, but we'll continue to ask. Right now, we feel like we have a pretty good uh, amount of personal protective equi equipment, and so that's good. And I think a lot of people have made their own masks, so, so they're wearing their masks, because that's really good. I hope everybody knows the CDC guidelines say that everybody, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, if you're in a public setting, you need to be wearing your mask. This Delta variant is not anything to play around with. It's not a joke. Uh, it's causing havoc on all of our lives, and so we really need to try to get a handle of it, uh, on it, and uh, do the best we can to protect each other. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you for being here, and we will be back next Wednesday at the same time. Thank you.